السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا خيرة الله وابن خيرته السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وابن سيد الوصيين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to episode number 15 of Reflections on Ziyarat Ashura brought to you by Mizan Institute. Wala'anallahu Umar ibn Sa'd. Another one of those individuals, another one of those criminals that is cursed in this ziyara is of course Umar ibn Sa'd who needs no introduction. Umar ibn Sa'd, he's the son of Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas that famous grand companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa that is revered, of course, greatly in the Sunni school of thought and is seen as one of the ten granted paradise. But in the Shia school of thought, um, is a bit controversial. He is because not like Talha and Zubair necessarily, they fought against Ali ibn Abi Talib in the Battle of Jamal. They are, of course, two of the grand Sahabis of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa as well, who are also in that hadith in the Sunni school of thought that says that there are ten granted paradise, Talha and Zubair, two of them, being two of them. He didn't fight Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas did not fight Ali ibn Abi Talib like Talha and Zubair. So he's not as controversial as they are. Yet there's a problem, and that is that uh, it is said that he never gave bay'ah an allegiance to Ali alayhi salam when he became Khalifa. And so this is a big problem itself. Of course, some people will see it as a positive thing that he didn't partake in any of the battles that took place during the time of the Khilafah of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas was neither on the side of Ali alayhi salam nor on the side of Muawiyah or Ashab al-Jamal and so on. But that doesn't mean that this is, was the right decision in the Shi'i school of thought's eyes. Because if you have a khalifa or an imam, whatever you want to call him, if you have the leader that everyone has agreed on, that he has been nominated as the fourth khalifa, you're supposed to help him in everything he does. If the first khalifa, second khalifa, third khalifa, if they had battles, what's for sure is that the Ashab were on his were on their sides, and they would help out there. So, what? Why is an exception being made for the fourth Khalifa being Ali ibn Abi Talib salam? It just makes sense that you, first of all, give your bayah to him. Second of all, you fight alongside him. But yes, some will praise Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas and say that you know he had figured it out. He was right in not taking any sides in those battles that uh, took place during the Khilafah of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. The Shi'i school of thought will not accept this. But as I said, it's one thing to not fight alongside Ali salam. It's another thing to fight against him. <laughs> so, yes, he will be controversial, but a little less controversial than the others that were mentioned. So that's the father of Umar ibn Sa'ad. So in reality, it's Umar ibn Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. Now let's talk about this Umar ibn Sa'ad son of Sa'ad. There are some stories I want to share with you before Karbala and then I'll also read off of some of the things that he was involved in uh, after, uh, during the Karbala and in the battle of uh, Karbala. So before Karbala, for example, we'll, ha- we'll see that uh, there's one story that is mentioned that Imam Ali, he was speaking to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas. He said to him, in your house there is someone who will kill my son Hussein. He said this to Sa'ad while Umar ibn Sa'ad was playing in the arms of Sa'ad. Now, they also say that Sa'ad, he was um, a playmate of Imam Hussein's. They would play with each other when they were kids. So this just makes it all the more problematic that these two growing up were playing with each other as kids. Uh, But of course, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Imam Hussein was a little older than Umar ibn Sa'ad. Uh, but all in all, these two knew each other from childhood. So this is Umar ibn Sa'ad as a child. Let's fast forward to, you know, after he's grown up, but before Karbala. One of the things that they mention about 
Umar ibn Sa'd is that he testified against Hujr bin Adi. Hujr bin Adi alongside his companions. This Hujr, he was a companion of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. Hujr was also a companion of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And some believe that he was also a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But that is contested by some. Anyway, this individual is known to be a very righteous, pious individual. But he was killed by the henchmen of Muawiyah. And that has its own story that um, I don't want to get into right now. But anyway, the reason why he was killed was some people testified against him. Now that testimony of them was maybe just a justification for his execution. Um, not that uh, they weren't going to execute him anyway. But whatever it is, Umar ibn Sa'd's name can be seen amongst those who testified against Hujr bin Adi, who was wrongfully killed along with his companions. And so he says, he says, he testifies that Hujr is causing fitna and has become kafir. And all of this, of course, leads to the execution of Hujr and his friends. So that's one thing that we have about Umar ibn Sa'd before Karbala. Another thing we have, uh, one of, another one of those negative things we have about him is that he was in Mecca, and when he saw that Imam Hussein has come to Mecca and how people are receiving him, he wrote to Yazid and informed him that Imam Hussein has come to Mecca. So he's one of the first ones, if not the first one, to write to Yazid and inform him about all of this. Another thing is re in regards to Muslim ibn Aqil. So Umar ibn Sa'ad, he's in Kufa when Muslim ibn Aqil is there. And so Muslim, of course, gathered all of that allegiance from the people of Kufa. And things were really in f going towards uh, the direction they were supposed to. Things were really in favor of a Muslim and by and as a result f in, in the favor of Imam Hussein. But what happened was, we all know, and I've we explained this uh, in a previous episode, that Ubaidullah bin Ziyad came and the table slowly turned in favor of Yazid and the followers of Yazid. So how'd that happen? Well, one of those who contributed to all of this one of those who caused Muslim to get in trouble was Umar ibn Sa'd. What did he do? He wrote a letter to Yazid and said, Remove Nu'man bin Bashir as your governor of Kufa. Because if you don't, then you're going to lose Kufa. You don't want to lose Kufa. I explained this also in that previous episode that this Nu'man bin Bashir, he was the governor of Kufa when Imam Hussein was making his way towards Kufa. This Nu'man, he had said, that I'm not going to fight anybody in Kufa. He knew that people that are pledging their allegiance to Muslim ibn Aqil uh, for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He knew about that. But he said, look, since you're not drawing swords, I'm not going to do anything either. This weakness on his part is what caused the likes of Umar ibn Sa'd to inform Yazid and really warn him of the imminent danger of Imam Hussein coming to Kufa and taking over. One of those who wrote a letter was Ibn Sa'ad, Umar ibn Sa'ad, to Yazid. And but finally, one more thing that happens in Kufa with Umar ibn Sa'ad is when Muslim Naqil has been taken in and arrested by the henchmen of uh, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, Muslim has a final will that he entrusts Umar ibn Sa'ad with. And Umar ibn Sa'ad discloses this final will. Muslim took him as his confidant. But that person, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he betrayed his trust and disclosed his final will to Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. And now let's fast forward to Karbala itself. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he is known for his involvement, direct involvement in Karbala. The main commander, the one who ordered for Imam Hussein to be killed, who made a lot of orders. Let me go through the list, inshallah, of some of the things that have been mentioned in regards to Umar ibn Sa'ad. So Umar ibn Sa'ad, how did he even end up in Karbala? Did he want to go? Not, not initially. They say Umar ibn Sa'ad was actually going to Ray, the city of Ray, to suppress a rise and revolt that was happening there. He was going with 4,000 with 4, soldiers to do that, to take care of that business. Ubaidullah, when he comes to Kufa, he says, no, 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 you have to go fight Hussein instead. And so Umar ibn Sa'ad, he refuses at first, but Ubaidullah said, okay, no problem, but you're going to lose the city of Ray that you were going to be taking over if you don't go and fight Hussein. So in other words, we will give you the city of Ray, but in return for fighting Hussein, defeating Hussein. 
And so this is where the famous story of Umar ibn Sa'd, we hear that he really thinks about this and he's, he knows that he, he has to choose between uh, Jannah and Jahannam. Fighting Hussein and ending up in Jahannam or not fighting Hussein and uh, earning Jannah as a result. He sees himself at this crossroad and of course he makes the wrong choice. He says, I just can't give up on the city of Ray. Um, and so he goes. He goes to fight Imam Hussein. And they say he arrives in Karbala on the second or third of Muharram. And so he sends somebody to ask why the Imam is there. What are you doing here, Imam Hussein? What are you doing in Karbala? What are you doing close to Kufa? And so the Imam, he replies, he says, the Kufans have invited me to come. Here are their letters. If you don't like, I'll go back to Medina. Let me go. And so here we see, because you know he knows that he's not supposed to fight Imam Hussein. We see from that day that he arrives in Karbala and starts negotiating with Imam Hussein back and forth. Yeah, he's trying to avoid bloodshed, avoid fighting Imam Hussein. So they say that Imam, the Imam, he spoke with him one one night. They got together, each of them with like twenty riders. They got together. And the Imam, he says to him, he says, Do you not fear Allah? Do you not know who I am? We grew up together. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says, They will destroy my home if I don't fight you. The Imam says, I'll provide you with another home. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, They will take my wealth. Imam says, I'll replace your wealth. Umar ibn Sa'ad stays quiet. The Imam says, I pray you are killed in your bed and Allah doesn't forgive you on the day of judgment. I hope you don't eat much of the wheat of Iraq. Meaning like you don't, take too much pleasure in things after you have killed me. Because that's what you're doing this for. You're doing this for your own good, your own interest, your own pleasure. I hope you don't take too much pleasure after me. Umar ibn Sa'ad, now this is what he says, and may Allah's curse be upon him. He says, don't worry, I'll eat barley instead. So the Imam says, I hope you don't eat much of the wheat of Iraq. Umar mockingly says, don't worry, I'll eat barley instead. May Allah's la'na be upon this individual for answering the Imam like this. So Umar ibn Sa'ad, he brings excuses, right? And the Imam answers them. Umar ibn Sa'ad goes quiet as if like, look, these are all just excuses. I'm going to fight you anyway. And so the Imam curses him in this way. So now let's go to the ninth of Muharram, the afternoon. This Umar ibn Sa'ad, when he wants to start the battle, and the battle, of course, some of you, if not most of you know, that the battle of Ashura, was actually supposed to take place on Tasu'a, on the 9th of Muharram in the afternoon. And so, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he calls out, Ya Khaylallah irkabi wa bil jannati abishiri. That, O army of Allah, O riders of Allah, mount your horses and have, hear the glad tidings and receive the glad tidings of Jannah. Because you're going to fight in the way of Allah, and you're gonna if you get killed, of course, you're gonna to go to Jannah. What a big lie. And of course, we know that the Imam he sent Abu Fadl Abbas alayhi salam to get a little bit of time from this army and to postpone the fight till the next day in the morning on the tenth of Muharram. And that story we all know how it goes. So now on the tenth, on Ashura. The Imam, one of the things he says to Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says, do you think you will kill me? And they will give you the rule of Ray and Gurgan. Gurgan is a place also in Iran. So Ray and Gurgan, they're in Iran. By Allah, you will never see such a thing. And so this is, this is, this is the crazy part, brothers and sisters. Sometimes you are going to sacrifice Akhirah for dunya, correct? You're going to sacrifice it, but at least you're going to get your hands on that dunya that you are sacrificing your akhirah for. All right, you're, you're, you're sacrificing your afterlife for what? For, I don't know, like a big lump of money that is not yours, but you do it anyway. And you eventually get your hands on that money. Sometimes that's what happens. Sometimes you do that, but you never get your hands on that money. With Umar ibn Sa'ad, the imam, he's telling him right now, he's like, look, you're destroying your akhirah for your dunya, but I'm just letting you know, they're not going to give it to you anyway. So it says, Umar ibn Sa'ad, he got angry and told his army, what are you waiting for? They are but a small morsel. In other words, attack. Don't even let them talk. I don't want to hear this. Another thing they say about Umar ibn Sa'ad on Ashura 
is that he was the one who shot the first arrow and told everyone to bear witness. He's the first to start the war. Of course, he wants to get all the credit. He wants to make sure that his superiors know that he fulfilled and carried out their commands by the T or to the T. So he's the one, they say, that shot the first arrow after it was all over, after the Ashab were killed, after the Ahlul Bayt were killed, after Imam Hussein salam was killed. He's the one, we all have heard this, he's the one who says, who, who, who tells 10 people, 10 writers to trample the body of Imam Hussein. So now let's fast forward after all of this. These are the crimes of this individual. May Allah's curse be upon him. Fast forward to Umar ibn Sa'ad being in the presence of Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. There are some things that happen there. There are some conversations and dialogues. One of those is this. Ubaidullah, he tells Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says, give me that letter I gave you. <laughs> Which letter? The letter that he had promised him the city of Ray in. You see, personally, I don't think it's uh, Ubaidullah is asking for the letter. Of course, Umar ibn Sa'ad knows why he's asking for the letter. He wants to tear it up because that is going to be evidence that Ubaidullah, this is my personal opinion, and I, there might be others out there who've said the same thing as well, that Ubaidullah knows that this letter is evidence and proof that he wanted this to happen. Ubaidullah wants to probably wash his hands of this as well and get rid of whatever evidence is out there that he might have sanctioned such a thing. So he's asking for this letter. What does Umar ibn Sa'ad say? He says, I've lost it. <laughs> you see how low this person has fallen. Like right after Karbala, he doesn't even get what he wanted. You see, sometimes you do, you commit oppression and it is oppression, but it is in a subtle way. Sometimes you'd commit oppression when it is clear as day that you are in the wrong and the other side is in the right. There is no gray area. Something like Karbala, you're not going to get away with it for long. All of these criminals and villains of Karbala, they got what came to them. They, right away, like they didn't, it didn't take too long before all of them were exterminated and destroyed in one way or another. All the way till Ubaidullah himself because they were directly involved. Now those who were indirectly involved, then the punishment of Allah eventually reached them too, but not as fast as it reached the ones who were directly involved. Umar ibn Sa'ad, he never saw and was never allowed or given the opportunity to even take the pleasures that he was after in the dunya, after what, what crimes he committed in, in Karbala. So right away, Ubaidullah is trying to get the letter from him Umar ibn Sa'ad knows that, okay, it doesn't look like they're going to even give me ray as Imam Hussein had prophesied. And so he says, it's been narrated that he said, Ibn, uh, Umar ibn Sa'ad said, no one has returned to his home in a worse state as me because I obeyed an atrocious and oppressive governor and I trampled justice and have cut ties. And when he says cut ties, of course he means the ties that everyone has with the Ahlul Bayt. So he says, there's no bigger loser than me. So that's, that's him in this whole story of Karbala. And of course, tons of other crimes that he committed, tons of other things that he did and said to Lady Zainab and others um, in Karbala. So let's talk about his death a little bit. His death, as I said, all of these criminals, all of these vil villains, they paid the price very, very quickly. And so for him, there's two things that they've said about him, that, about his death. One is that the Tawabin, they rose after Karbala. And I talked about the Tawabin before, these people who betrayed Imam Hussein or deserted Imam Hussein, let's say. And although they had invited him, led by Sulaiman bin Surat al Khuzai, these Tawabin, they rose, they said, we, what, what a bad thing we did. We're going to fight the Banu Umayyah till we die. And the story of that, you know, as I said, I, I've mentioned before, so I'm not going to go back to it. These Tawabin, they rose. Umar ibn Sa'ad, being the, one of the greatest culprits in Ashura, he hid in Darul, Ima, Darul Imara. Um, and during the rise of Mukhtar, he fled Kufa with uh, Muhammad bin Ash'ath, which this guy is also a problematic, the son of Ash'ath bin Qais. Later, when they revolted against Mukhtar, he returned to Kufa to fight against Mukhtar, but they were defeated, so he fled once again towards Basra to join Mus'ab bin Zubair. What a loser. This guy is running around trying to join forces with different people uh, because, of course, of what he's done and everyone knows and everyone's after him. 
But so he wants to join forces with Mus'ab bin Zubair, who is anti Bani Umayyah. So this guy, Umar ibn Sa'd, was on the side of Bani Umayyah. Now he's on the side of Bani Zubair. But Mukhtar uh, sent someone to pursue him and bring him back. So before he can even make it to Mus'ab bin Zubair and join forces with him, Mukhtar gets his hands on him first. They burned um, his body. They burned his uh, son's body by the name of Hafs. And sent the heads of these two to Muhammad bin Hanafiya in Medina. That's one account of what happened to him. But if you remember, and I think this next account that I'm going to share with you um, is uh, is one that I, is maybe more famously uh, held. This other account holds that Mukhtar's people got their hands on Umar ibn Sa'ad while he was sleeping in his home on his bed. And they killed him there. And this fulfilled the prophecy of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on Ashura. Imam Hussein had told him that this is going to happen to you. And they bring the head of Umar ibn Sa'ad to Mukhtar. And Hafs, the son of Umar, was also there. And Hafs says that life after Umar ibn Sa'ad is no good and things like that. And so Mukhtar kills Hafs as well. And so this is the fate of Umar ibn Sa'ad and his son this one of the most wretched people of all time, one that all Muslims, no matter what school of thought they're from, even in the most extreme anti-Shi'i school of thought that they might subscribe to, are against. This Umar ibn Sa'ad, a person that everyone curses, a person that no one can find any way to justify what he did and his involvement in Ashura. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعلى علي ابن الحسن وعلى أولاد الحسن وعلى أصحاب الحسن